KMCV Channel 7, the only local channel covering all of the CNMI. We're all about to settle in for a wrap-up of the day's events. Here's a glimpse of all the packages we'll be delivering. A gift is on its way. The Senate passes two of the three sections of the budget this morning. Tinian and Rhoda senators fought hard for appropriations for their islands. And surprise inspections of 16 of the 20 garment factory barracks is turning up few, if any, violations. Only two warnings have been issued. And aggravated assault charges are filed today against attorney Ted Mitchell for an incident nine days ago at the Cafe Magambo. All of that plus much more next on KMCV News. Buenas noches, para todos Hamzu, Tao Tao, Saipan, Tinians, and Luta, Guahu, Siguan, Wakai. Good evening, and welcome to the middle of the week cast of KMCV News. I'm Carlotta de Leon Guerrero, Longshot Willie, and Vicky Tadella. Join us later in the cast with a look at sports and weather. But first, topping our cast this evening. Despite a fresh version of the 93 CNMI budget, the page it's written on still seems to be made out of rubber. As promised, the Senate called session today to work on the new three-part Appropriation Act recently passed by the House. But as Nanette Miranda reports, it didn't take very long for the senators to send it back to the lower house. The CNMI Constitution calls for one unified budget. That's why before discussions on the new proposal began, senators weren't quite sure of the legality of the new three-part Appropriations Act. I believe the Attorney General came out with an opinion that uh, stated that that there should be a unified body in the Commonwealth. I understand our constitutional analysis indicates so. Some senators did not want to compromise the legal issue. Senator Juan Torres, for instance, wanted to combine all three sections into one proposal. But if we want to have an all-inclusive budget for the government, I propose that since the House did not take that approach, why couldn't the Senate amend all this uh, uh, separated, separated budget and put it in one and let's go back and, 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 and talk about it, discuss it. In the end, the senators united with one voice, leaving the legality issue aside for the sake of having a budget. I think, Mr. President, the people out there, our people here, uh, they don't care anymore about deficit. They don't care about lapses. They don't care about FTEs. They don't care about CIP. They don't care about Anything now in the budget, they just want to see the legislature pass a budget. But first, without voicing that the delegation from Rhoda and Tinian is not to blame for the delay of the budget. Members say they were only fighting for the survival of their islands. Mr. President, at the maximum funding level that Tinian will be getting, including the lapses of 400,000, is only 9 million. The maximum for Rota will be getting, including the lapses, is estimated close to $10 million. When you put Rota and Tinian together, it's going to come down to $19 million. We have a proposed budget here of $159 plus million. When you minus this, Mr. President, Saipan will be getting $140 million. When you look at the lapses for Tinian and Rota, it's only $1.4 million. Why is Congressman Regis holding hostage to the $140 million that would have to go to PSS, would have to go to CHC, be just because of this $1.4 million lapses that only were asking for a renewal authorization, it, is, it was given to us already. What we're asking here is just a simple renewal authorization to keep these lapses. 
Today, members acted only on the first two parts of the budget. Part 1, or 309, was left unamended. Part 2, or 310, gave additional reprogramming authority to the governor and the two mayors of Rhoda and Tinian. No figures were actually changed. However, you know, give us at least this administrative language that allows uh, our mayors and our governor to, to play with the figure, the that you, you give us. The Senate stopped after passing the first two parts of the budget because they want to see first how the House handles their amendments. Members say why tackle the most difficult part of the budget if the first two aren't even amenable to the lower House. If the House approves the reprogramming amendment, the Senate is likely to pass part three of the budget the way it is. In Capitol Hill, Nanette Miranda for KMCV News. The first garment factory was established 12 years ago, and since then, the industry has bolstered government coffers to the tune of $30 million annually. But recently, garment factories have become a thorn in the CNMI's side. Labor abuses have grabbed the national media attention and has encumbered the CNMI's relationship to the federal government. To right any wrongs that still exist, labor officials are stepping up inspections of garment factories. It wasn't that long ago when local garment factories were being slapped left and right with labor violations. The governor recently followed up by ordering random barracks inspections. So far, Commerce and Labor Director Jack Torres says inspectors have hit 16 of the 20 local garment factories. We're primarily interested in, in uh, 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 living space, the 50 square feet per person, uh, cleanliness. Torres says the slates are generally clean. Labor has only issued two notices of warning. Uh, the violations are, are, are manageable. Uh, they're not as, as bad as, uh, uh, as before. And um, hopefully uh, um, things uh, would be much improved uh, uh, by, with the presence of OSHA and our presence. Acting Governor Benjamin T. Manglotnia applauds Labor's uh, enforcement by efforts. Doing this, I'm sure it provides confidence not only to our people but to the federal government. And I think it's, uh, it, it will help uh, us and it's help our image and our reputation also with the federal government. But we're doing it more frequently now. In, in, um, in, in the past, uh, uh, basically once a facility is inspected, uh, um, we re-inspect them uh, if additional workers are added. Uh, now we're, uh, we're, we hope to do it every three months. A majority of those piecing clothes together are Thai, Chinese, and Koreans. Torres says they are generally less sophisticated employees than those contracted in other industries. I'd like to share uh, concerns with, uh, with you. Um, we have to pry. Torres says future increases in, in inspections are dependent upon government funding. Acting Governor Benjamin Manglonia hopes to revive the 902 consultations between the NMI and the federal government. 902 is a covenant provision that calls for regular meetings between the two governments. Manglonia sees resumption of the 902 talks as a way to improve our relations with the federal government. The purpose of 902 is to be able to sit on a bargaining table in a table where we could discuss our CMNI federal relationship. And because of all this uh, allegation that's been leveled against us, uh, it is my view that uh, it is even more important now uh, to have a 902 consultation uh, continue so that we, we, we can sit down and start talking about labor abuses, uh, living standard of our alien. Uh, we can talk about reforms, uh, and we can talk on a wide range of issues. Manglonia was the rep to the 902 talks during President Bush's administration. President Clinton has yet to appoint anyone from his administration to handle 902 discussions. The Commonwealth Utilities Corporation is about to handle its third audit of the year. First, the House Committee on Public Utilities subpoenaed CUC's records. Then the Inspector General's Office began an audit of CUC's records at CUC's request. And next month, the CUC will foot half of the $300,000 bill for a management audit. The Department of Interior will pay the other half. CUC Public Information Officer Pamela Mathis says there is room for improvement in the utility in the arena of the financial arena. We're doing great on the physical aspects, you know, mm -hmm. getting the pipe into the ground, um, getting the power lines to the people. It's the financial part that we have to look at long range and get some help on. And 
we finalized some of those plans. CUC Director Ray Guerrero and Interior officials Les Bogg met with in Washington last month to interview the bidders for the $300,000 contract. They chose Metzer & Associates. The firm has a track record of improving the financial management system of utility companies across the United States. The management audit firm will be here in September. It will be a 17-week evaluation of CUC. Financial records, management, operations, where we buy our fuel, how we store it. They're looking into absolutely everything in the corporation and the long-range needs of the community. They will be talking to people of the community, big business, the legislators. They want the full picture. And then they will decide exactly what steps we need to take. CUC's board is also in the process of hiring a U.S. comptroller and a data systems administrator. When we come back, a man on the street interview with Islanders about legislating morality. And we outline the proposed Tinian leaseback proposal. Details next. It finally happened. After a brawl at a Garapan nightclub last week, attorney Ted Mitchell was, has been charged with aggravated assault of James Grizzard. Chief Prosecutor Cheryl Gill gathered eyewitness reports of the incident and lodged the charge this afternoon. The dispute at Cafe Magumbo began with verbal exchanges between Ted Mitchell and consultant David Wickline. Grizzard tried to intervene and sustained serious head injuries in the process. Mitchell admits to shoving Grizzard backwards, but he claims he did so in self-defense, fearing that Grizzard was going to attack him. That version of the incident is not echoed by anyone else KMCV News has talked to, nor does it match testimony given to law enforcement officials. Mitchell is scheduled to appear in court for an initial appearance tomorrow morning. In a side note, aggravated assault is a felony. Attorneys convicted of a felony are not automatically disbarred from practicing law in the Commonwealth. According to the disciplinary rules, if ordered, that attorney would have to appear before the Superior Court and show cause why he or she should not be immediately restrained from the practice of law. The NMI has outlawed prostitution, and now efforts are underway to carry that a step further and outlaw the viewing of sex. Congressman Francisco Flores has introduced three bills that would prevent clubs from hiring strippers or putting on live sex shows. Today we talked to a number of people to find out if they think this effort to legislate morality is a worthwhile one or not. To control some of the uh, prostitution and stuff like that. You know, I mean, as far as prostitution, some of this, I think, yes, uh, the legislature should get involved and uh, set some guidelines. Do you think the legislature, lawmakers should get involved in legislating morality? Uh, no, actually I don't. Um, I think that to the extent that there, that there are crimes where there are, are real victims, I think that that should be the focus of attention and the attention as to the other problems that the NMI are currently facing. And, um, and if they are going to crack down on certain things, I would hope that they focus in on who the, the real perpetrators are and not just arrest um, some of the girls. Do you think lawmakers should get involved in legislating morality, anti-prostitution, uh, uh, laws of this nature? Uh, I wasn't ready for that one. <laughs> yeah, I think so. They should be. Uh, they're the ones making the law, so uh, I think they should be really uh, into this one. Yeah, I think so, because to at least to protect, you know, the women and the uh, citizens also, and also their families, the ones that are concerned, you know. They're the one who's really the number one concern, especially the family, you know. It will also be the future for the children, the one that is coming in, you know, for the near future to have a morality standard. They better, because, uh, you know, like it's been happening all around the island, and I think they better do it. So you would support this yes. type of effort from lawmakers? Of course. Of course. I think they should get involved in it. What are your thoughts on it? I think it should be on style, prostitution laws. So you support any efforts to uh, um, regulate or to outlaw? Right. Oh, every time you regulate morality, you say it's illegal, people find ways to get around it. And make more money. And it. make more money. You know, if they want to regulate it, tax it. You know, do like Nevada does, tax it and then do it that way. Tax it so much that they can't do it if they want to get around it that way. Well, I don't have any good answer to respond to your question right now. Uh, let the lawmakers uh, decide what to do, you know. So you, you, put, uh, you have a lot of faith in the lawmakers to, to grapple with this issue? 
Absolutely. And we're wondering if you if you agree with this uh, that lawmakers should get involved in uh, legislating morality. Yes, sir. I do. Okay. So you would support any effort by lawmakers to yeah, in this area? Yeah, I support. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. It should be allowed. In prostitution mm -hmm. should make it good for the economy. So uh, one gentleman said it should be taxed if we allow prostitution. Yeah, he's right then. If they think the economy is going down from tourism, then they should tax prostitution. Well, I've been here just about a week. I don't know what the actual rules are in here in the Marianas. Just driving around the Strip the other night, I noticed that it looked like there was a lot of availability for that type of behavior. Um, I don't know exactly what they can do out here, if there's a way of controlling it. I mean, it's not legalized in the United States. I don't know why it should be legalized out here. I think we should be concerned more about the uh <clears throat> the big controversy between the uh, Ferragam and, and uh, Cinema is uh, because of the, the influx of uh, uh, non-resident workers here. And it looks like uh, the nightclub, uh, all these girls, it looks like uh, one of the industries that are trying to make this as, as an industry here, which is, this is ridiculous. We should be concerned about uh, the... Uh, our future here, rather than uh, let the federal government concern about our future. I think they should, they should definitely be involved, yes. I think it's very important, especially in this culture here. And I think they should definitely be legislating against anti-what's anti, anti, it, live sex shows, against that in particular. I think prostitution is really um, destroying the culture in this, on this, in this island. And so I think they should definitely be involved in it. So you'd support legislation? To I would certainly it. would, yes. They should. Could you tell us why, why, why you thought so? Because <laughs> they're the ones, you know, uh, working for the people, so they have the right. The author of the anti-prostitution law, Congresswoman Ana Terragezo, will be our guest tonight on the John Anderson Show at 7 o'clock. Be sure and stay tuned for that show. If the United States no longer has a need for its leasehold on Tinian, then the covenant provides that it be leased back to the CNMI government until such time as the U.S. does need the land. Negotiations to effect that transfer have begun, and here's a brief look at the proposed terms and conditions offered by the CNMI government for review. The Tinian draft leaseback proposal is sure to be a topic of discussion at next month's meeting of the Civilian Military Advisory Council, or CMAC. The lease, put together by the Guerrero administration, was presented July 14th at the first CMAC meeting. The CNMI government is attempting to lease back two areas from the U.S. government. Area 1 contains 11,840 acres of land. Area 2 is much smaller, containing just 300 acres. Both areas would be leased back for 50 years, according to the leaseback proposal, although the Commonwealth wants the right to extend the leaseback periods if it so chooses. The annual rent will be $12,140, or a dollar an acre. There are a number of proposed restrictions on how the land can be used. Number one, land use must be compatible with military activities. Number two, no permanent structures will be allowed without the prior consent of the U.S. government. Number three, Federal Aviation Administration safety zones apply to land uses. Number four, uses that damage the land will not be permitted. Number five, leaseback and subleases will be subject to cancellation with just one year notice or sooner if needed by the U.S. military or for national emergencies. Number six, compensation for early cancellation will be paid at fair market value by the U.S. government. The proposed Tinian leaseback makes provisions for existing leases within the designated areas. The Micronesian Development Company, or MDC, lease shall continue through June 10, 1995, and the mobile lease in Area 2 will be allowed to continue through September of 1994. Permanent improvements to the property will be allowed only with the permission of the U.S. government. In an effort to spur development, two-story structures built fronting the Broadway do not require the permission of the U.S. government. The leaseback also contains a provision that outlines who may not benefit from the leaseback proposal should it be accepted by the U.S. Article 20, titled, Officials Not to Benefit, states, No member of or delegate to Congress 
or resident commissioner of the United States of elected or appointed official of the Commonwealth shall be admitted to any share or part of this leaseback agreement or to any benefit to arise therefrom. But this provision shall not be construed to extend to this leaseback agreement if made with a corporation for its general benefit. The CNMI government is represented by six people in the leaseback negotiations. Two people will be recommended by the Tinian Mayor's Office, two from the Governor's Office, and those two people are Sid Sablan and Manny Vizagomez, one person from the Ports Authority, and one person from the Marianas Public Land Corporation. Thank you very much, Vicky. Muga mabira estina estacion si Vicky para utatati después para y asunto siete. And following Vicky's tomorrow newscast, please join us for the John Anderson Live call in talk show. John's guest tonight will be Congresswoman Ana Terregezu, the author of the NMI's anti prostitution law, which recently gained the limelight when the police department began actively to enforce it. So stay tuned for an informative night of TV viewing right here on KMCV Channel 7. On behalf of the entire KMCV news team, thanks for joining us tonight, and we'll see you back again tomorrow night. Good night. Good night. Good night.